Hello, welcome. I'm Matt Darun. Uh, it's great that you can join us as we continue our journey through the historical account of Jesus' life written by John. Uh, please open up your Bibles to the last part of John chapter 3. Uh, and I want us uh, to get us thinking about what God wants for us to understand from this passage. I, I wanted to ask you if you've ever had your glory stolen. You know, if there's one act that can steal the glory of a moment away, one move that can destroy the meaning of a memory, one look that can take all the attention, it's photobombing. Uh, not sure if you've experienced this phenomenon before. You know, the perfect shot is about to be taken with friends or the wedding, and one individual can get into the photo and steal the attention away. I photobombed before, and perhaps you have as well. Here's two quick examples uh, of uh, what, it, what it's like, of what it is. All the focus and attention is drawn away from where it's meant to be. And there's something in, inherently human about photobombing. It's really about making it all about ourselves, taking the attention away from where it should be, and it ruins photos. You can't put that picture up of your wedding no matter how good it is because one person ruined the whole scene. To be a photo bomber is to be a glory thief. Many of you have probably never photo bombed in your life. You're a better person than me. Uh, but photo bombs are, are fairly harmless in the end, e even funny for some. Uh, but there are ways that we steal the glory that are more sinister and can cause more harm. In life, we still often act as if we deserve the focus. It's why when your friend or spouse isn't paying attention when you're talking, it really annoys you. It's why we want weather that suits our plans. It's why we can relate to the main character in every book or film, because we see ourselves as the actor of our life, the one that the movie is all about. Many people like the center stage, and those who don't enjoy the spotlight still crave attention from those they love. It's natural. It's human. The, the problem is, though, when it becomes inappropriate, like a photo bomber at a wedding. Often it's wrong for us to have this attitude. And we're going to see that this attitude stops us having joy. We're going to see how a better perspective can give us a greater joy. We're going to see how to truly live. Because today God shows us what this looks like in the life of John the Baptizer. We keep running into this man, John the Baptizer. This is the last scene though he has in John's Gospel. And we find that he has a twofold claim. This is what it is. I'm not the main attraction. Jesus is the main attraction. So, so let's consider this first statement. I'm not the main attraction. See, the baptizer John has a few followers who are, who are just like us. They see all the attention fading away from them. And instead of people coming to be baptized by them, by, by John the baptizer, they're now going to Jesus and his followers. You know, they used to be the main attraction. Everyone was coming to them. And now they're getting jibbed, less important, and they're naturally put out. So they come to the baptizer and practically blame him for, for pointing out Jesus. Look at verse 26 with me. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan to whom you bore witness, look, he's baptizing and all are going to him. John's losing the focus, and his followers are feeling it. And you can imagine the baptizer would feel it even more. You, you wonder what he'll do to get the focus back on him. Maybe, maybe start offering a better baptizing experience. Maybe remind everyone that he's still an important part. Or maybe hold even more tightly to the little attention he has left. Maybe take back that comment he, he made about Jesus. That's, that's probably what most of us would do. But the baptizer goes against the grain. Instead, he says, 
God's in charge. He, he knows what he's doing, and I'm not the main attraction. See it there in verse 27. John answered, A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. All John does is he just reiterates what he's already said. He, his glory is waning and he just opens up his hand and, and lets it all go. And the reason is because he's not the main attraction. It's not his wedding. And that's how he explains it in verse 29 to 30. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom, the friend of the bridegroom, who stands and hears him, rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. That's a life motto if there ever was one. Jesus must increase, but I must decrease. See, John explains, I'm not the groom. I'm just the best man. Now, I've been a best man a few times before, and I'll, I'll offer some free advice. This is, the, this is the biggest mistake you could ever make, all right? Uh, do not do this when you're the best man. It's worse than not organizing the bucks. It's worse than losing the rings. It's even worse than insulting the mother-in-law in your best man speech. The worst ma move that you can make is to show up on the day and decide to be the groom instead of the best man. You know, imagine if... When the bride walks down the aisle and the father passes her over and the best man goes down to shake the dad's hand and, and lead the bride up to the altar. Or imagine when the vows are being read out and the best man, he yells out, I do. Or imagine if when it was time for the kiss, the best man leans in, puckered up and, and ready. No one wants that. That's the worst mistake you could make. I'm glad I haven't made that mistake. And the baptizer here, he doesn't make that mistake either. Instead, the best man's job is to make the groom look good. In the best man's speech, you know, you often rip the groom to shreds and, and tell all the most embarrassing stories. But in the end, you say why he's the best mate anyone could have. He's the guy. And that's the way it's meant to be. But I wonder if we're really like that with Jesus. Have we accepted, like John does here, that he's the groom and we're just the best man? See, the sooner we understand, like John the baptizer, I'm not the main attraction, the closer we come to saying with John, how he says it there, our joy is now complete. And we'll think more about that and what it looks like later. But, but this raises a question. If John isn't the main attraction and he tells us that Jesus is the main attraction, then why? Why is he so convinced that Jesus is the main attraction? So that's what we're going to explore right now. And that's what the next six verses are really all about. They explain why Jesus deserves to be the main attraction. John says, I'm not the main attraction. Jesus is the main attraction. Why? It's because, it's because of where he comes from. It's because of the words he speaks. And it's because of the life he offers. See, Jesus comes from heaven. And this puts him on a plane where no one else can stand. And that's what verse 31 says. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. So the one who flung stars into space... It came down, 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 down into, into our muck. And at one time, we could, have, we could have held him in our hands. And that's just extraordinary. And this means that Jesus is greater than anyone else you might admire. Your favorite athlete, most, most famous movie star, 
most enjoyable social commentator, most admired person. They're all from earth and can only speak about what they know. But, but Jesus is from heaven. He knows so much more. And, and so he speaks about it. Look at verse 32 to 34. He bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives the spirit without measure. See, prophets only had the spirit on them for a time, but Jesus is different. He has it without measure. So that whoever listens to Jesus, they they say, by listening to Jesus, you're saying that God is true. Because Jesus' words are God's words. Jesus deserves to be the main attraction because he's the only one who comes from heaven. And no one else can make that claim. He's the only one who only ever spoke The words of God. John the baptizer rightly says, I'm not the main attraction. Jesus is the main attraction. Get the spotlight off me and shine it completely on Jesus. Because Jesus not only comes from heaven and speaks the very words of God. He is God's son. So that anyone who believes in him will have life. Life at its very best. Look at verse 35 to 36. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into His hand. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Jesus holds all things in his hands. He has the complete love of the Father. And by believing in Jesus and his life and death and resurrection, we can have life at his very best. We can have eternal life, it says. But notice that eternal life in this verse is actually in the present tense. And that means that it begins now. Later in John, Uh, In in chapter 17, he, he says this, And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That's eternal life. And that begins now. That's living life to the full, having life abundantly, as John calls it in in chapter 10. A relationship with God begins now and will bloom into full technicolor in the next age where we'll experience the bliss of it all completely and notice in that verse belief and obedience are parallels it's because the first step of obedience is belief and if we don't believe then god's just wrath remains on us And this makes sense. If you reject the Son, what can happen but wrath from the Father? A righteous indignation. Don't you realize who He is and, and what He's done? He's speaking the words of God, the absolute authority. And don't you understand the seriousness? It's it's about life, John's saying. Don't reject the Son. Don't reject Jesus. Jesus is what it's all about. John knows, as we all should know, I'm not the main attraction. Jesus is the main attraction. See, John knows his place. He knows that if it's a stage, he's just a support act. He knows it's time to get off the stage now. And that's what we need to make sure we're doing. We need to make sure we're not glory thieves. Uh, the rock band, U2, was once called rock's hottest ticket. They, they were the greatest. And uh, one time while they were touring, uh, we're touring North America, 
And Bono brings out one guy from the audience to the stage. And this guy, all he is is an audience member. That's it. But this guy picks up a guitar and he starts playing a song. The only problem is, as everyone quickly discovers, he isn't very good at all. But, but you know, this is his moment of glory. And he plays and he jumps around and he sings wildly, making a complete fool of himself. And the other problem is that at the end of the song, he doesn't leave the stage. You know, this is his moment of glory and, and he's holding on to it. And Bono has, has to lead him off the stage. This, this audience member doesn't realize it, it's not about him. It, he doesn't deserve to stay on the stage because he doesn't even compare to you two. If he had any sense, he, he should have sat down and enjoyed the concert along with everyone else. But instead, he just, he just makes a complete fool of himself. See, we don't compare to Jesus. We should not receive for ourselves the glory that belongs to Jesus alone. This life is not primarily about you or me. God's, God's great plan for this world is first. And foremost about Jesus. It's about him being honored and glorified above all. You're not the main attraction. Jesus is the main attraction. So don't be a glory thief. Like, like every little child growing up, eventually they need to be told at some point, it's not all about you. This life is not primarily about you or, or me. It's about Jesus. It's about His honor. It's about His glory. This life, your life, my life, is to be lived for Him, to His praise and to His honor. Yet if we pause for a moment and just think about it, at times, we can be just like glory-thieving photobombers, attention-hogging best men, stage-stealing audience members at a U2 concert, carrying on as though this life is all about us, when that's just not the case. So it's good to reflect on our lives. How do we talk and live in a way that says, I'm not the main attraction. Jesus is the main attraction. We can do it in the way we use our money. You know, spending it to build our own comfortable little kingdoms. Seeking our own glory. Rather than investing our, our money in causes that advance God's kingdom and brings Christ's glory. So... How are you going? Using money to bring attention to Christ. We can be glory thieves in our homes, in our relationships with family members. When we get angry, when, when our needs are not being met, when our desires are not being met. R rather than bringing Christ's glory in, in the way that we love each other. So how are you going in your relationships, in, in making Christ the center of attention? We can be glory thieves in, in the way we serve at church as well. Uh, whether it's uh, praying or reading or leading or preaching or singing, even cooking. When we're more concerned with the praise we'll receive than the glory, our humble service will bring to Christ. So, are you serving at church or, or over Zoom for the praise of people or of Jesus? We can be glory thieves in our friendships with, uh, with people who do not yet know Jesus. In, in not talking about Christ because we're more concerned about enjoying that friendship than giving Christ the glory. Are you loving them enough 
to, to speak with them about Jesus. We can be glory thieves in the way we think of our job, our careers, when, when the riches and esteem of the world mean more to us than hearing our Savior, Jesus Christ, say, well done, good and faithful servant. So is your job ultimately about you or about serving Christ's purposes in this world? We can be glory thieves in the aspirations that we have, even for our children. You know, when our, when our greatest desire is for them to bring us honor rather than God. Do you feel worse because they make you look bad or, or because they rebel against God? And finally, we can be glory thieves when people praise us for something we do well, <laughs> when our hearts crave that acknowledgement and take all the credit for ourselves. Do you remember that all things are only ever given from our Heavenly Father, like John says in verse 27 there? It's a daily temptation. To live as though it's all about us. Our own glory is so fleeting though and unsatisfying. Here in Australia, there's, there's probably no greater earthly glory than, than sporting glory. We put them on, on, on pedestals. Uh, yet we read so often of another retired sporting hero hitting rock bottom. Because they've, because they've realized that earthly glory never satisfies the new series on netflix that, that looks at michael jordan's last season with the bulls the last dance is extraordinary because jordan's jordan's greatest passion the, the drove every fiber of his being was to be the best he, he couldn't stand it if someone else was said of being greater than him and that's that's what drove him if his popularity plummeted, he would drive harder to get it back. The, the earthly glory that Jordan has achieved is, is phenomenal. His legacy on the basketball court, I'd say, is unmatched. But now that Jordan has retired for the, for the third time, he says himself, he says, How can I find peace away from the game of basketball? See, all glory is fleeting. This shining monument of greatness in basketball will, will be slowly chipped away, eroded over time. The, the glory that even Jordan achieved now just, just leaves him lost. Now just leaves him without any identity. And, and when asked what he'll do without the game, he can just respond with, you learn to live with it. But there's a glory that is much, much bigger. A glory that is eternal and satisfying. Jesus, the Word of God, the Son of God, the Lamb of God, the one who is coming. The one John said of, my joy is now complete. Even while his own popularity plummeted. Even while he faced increasing opposition. He found this joy because he rose above his circumstances, he found his purpose in Christ's glory. He found joy there. But too often we act like the guy at the rock concert. So, so what's the cure? We're, we're to be like John and raise our eyes beyond ourselves to Jesus to see how amazing our Savior is. It's a bit like being at the Grand Canyon or in front of a beautiful sunset. Uh, I've never actually been to the Grand Canyon, but everyone says it's very difficult to sit on the edge of the Grand Canyon and to think, man, I'm awesome. Or when you look out at that view, you can only be humbled and think how amazing it is. And that's who Jesus is. Nothing compares to Jesus, nothing at all. So let's get off the stage, 
Let's get out of the photo. Let's magnify the groom. Let's make sure that when people look at us, that we point over to our great Savior, to whom truly belongs all the glory. And this fills us with that true lasting joy that only Jesus can give when we say, I'm not the main attraction. Jesus is the main attraction. My life is about him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that that Jesus is so glorious. That he is so far above us and so wonderful. And yet he came down to earth to die for us. To to live a life of obedience for us. To to come back to life for us. so So that we could be forgiven and enjoy eternal life. Enjoy a relationship with you now that we will only experience completely in the future, in the next age, when Christ comes back or we pass. So we thank you for Jesus. And Father, forgive us when we try and hog that attention and that, and that glory to ourselves, when we put ourselves in the wrong place that so we're always tempted to do. But instead, help us to focus on Jesus, to give him the praise and the glory and the honor, to realize that we're not the main attraction. That Jesus is the main attraction. That our lives are about Him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.